Perfect. Well, friends, we're glad that you're here with us today. Um, we are about to start our Sunday morning service. Uh, we are glad that you've decided to tune in, and we do this every week. So you can either tune in on our Facebook page, or you can turn in through, tune in through YouTube and see a recorded copy of it. Um, we hope that you enjoy what you see, and we're just glad that you chose to worship with us. Thanks again.
Good morning and welcome. Just want to uh, announce this morning, I'm going to be uh, opening this morning with our prayers and and uh, and instead of closing, and, and our closing this morning, we were, uh, will end after the message, we'll end in, in song. Um, and so um, as we do that, I know that this is a, a harder time, a lot of times we try to offer a, opportunity for any prayer requests um, at the end and, and if anybody has those uh, but what we'd like to do today is if you have uh, a need and would like one of the elders to pray with you at the, during that closing song if you would just raise your hand uh, we will come to where you are and, and, uh, and be able to pray with you at that time If it doesn't work to, to get a hold of us, don't hesitate to give us a phone call or send us a text as well. We, we just like to keep in touch. Um, last week we had a few announcements that, um, that uh, people that we were praying for and we want to continue to kind of update that. Um, Doug went in for an angiogram and found that there was quite a bit of blockage. Uh, we want to keep Doug in our prayers because uh, um, I don't I don't have the date, but I understand he is going to be going in for a procedure um, and, and surgery, and so we want to uh, uh, be mindful of, of Doug uh, uh, during this time. I know Judy, we prayed for uh, Monday. She went in for some surgery on her back, and and uh, I understand is is home and and doing well, uh, just recovering from the. 
the pain of the surgery, but hoping that the, uh, the nerve damage that she had had or the pain she was having from that is going to be relieved. Um, uh, the heirs mentioned this morning that their grandson, uh, Hunter, is going into the Marines today. We want to thank him for his service and, and just keep him in his prayers as, as he takes, that, um, takes on that journey. Um, next Sunday, um, Sharon is going to be going to Seattle for surgery uh, for on Monday, and so we want to uh, uh, keep them in our prayers, and, and we will remember uh, remember uh, her this morning in our prayers. So, uh, Sharon, we will be praying for you and Jim. Also, I was reminded uh, or mentioned this morning that Barbara Harmon has been in the hospital for. Uh, uh, the last few days and, and uh, we want to uh, keep Barbara and of course uh, all the caregivers there um, Kaylin I know is, is, is actively uh, helping and Bob uh, so we want to remember them um, I want to uh, read a, a, just a, a brief email we received from uh, Peggy this week that she was scheduled to go in for surgery tomorrow, and, and as they were doing uh, ultrasound, they found some lesions. Um, and so she is going in this morning for an MRI, and uh, we wanna uh, just, I, I know she had had uh, uh, scheduled surgeries uh, for her uh, knee replacement and so forth. Uh, that has been postponed at this point, and so we wanna remember Peggy as well uh, in our prayer together. Would you pray with me? Our God and our Father, we come before you. Lord, you have blessed us richly. We have, a, we have a hope, God, that you have provided through the blood of your Son, the forgiveness, God, of our sins. And God, you have made us whole, and we just are thankful. Father God, we just ask that you are with those that we mentioned this morning for Barbara and, and Peggy as they're up at the hospital today, uh, for Doug as he's going to be uh, going in for uh, surgery, um, for Sharon as, as she goes in for surgery. We thank you, God, for the healing you're providing Judy, and, and God, we just pray that you continue to be with her. Bring healing, God, to all of those who, who are struggling we're thankful for the hope, God, that, that you give us beyond this life. Father God, be with us this morning as we have a time of worship and as we praise you. It is in your Son we pray. Amen. I'd like to read a passage this morning from Proverbs. It's in the third chapter, verses 3 through 6. It says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Find them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. In all ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Let's continue our time of worship. Give thanks to the Lord for the works of his hand, for a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Give thanks to the Lord, for we all now can stand, and fear not of being forsaken. Give thanks to the Lord for his righteousness. Give thanks to the Lord for his love. Let us worship his name and his own. Give thanks to the Lord, oh give thanks to the Lord, give thanks, give thanks to the Father for sending his Son, give thanks to the Son for the Spirit, now lift up your voices to God three in one, and shout so the whole world can hear. Give thanks to the Lord for his right. 
righteousness. Give thanks to the Lord for his love. Let us worship his name and his holiness. Give thanks to the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord for his righteousness. Give thanks to the Lord for his love. Let us worship his name and his holiness. Give thanks to the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks. Give thanks. My hope is filled on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same.
God has always made covenants with his people, starting with Noah in Genesis 9-9. Uh, that never again will the earth be destroyed by water. We got another one with Abraham, Abraham in Genesis 17. That nations and kings will come from him and that they will be his chosen people. A covenant was made with the Israelites that were led into the promised land that as long as they remain faithful to God, uh, he will bless them and never leave them. Plus this covenant was broken uh, many times and consequences were rapid and harsh from losing in battle to being led off into captivity. Today we celebrate the, another covenant that was established with all people of the earth. Uh, and you read about this in Hebrews 10, 1 through 7. Kind of changing from the old covenant to the new covenant. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near for worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all, and would no longer have been, uh, excuse me, and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sin. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to you to do, excuse me, I have come to do your will, my God. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their heart, and I will put, write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts will remember no more. This is a covenant, covenant established and sealed with the blood of Christ Jesus on the cross. All that's required of, of us is that we repent, turn from sin, and obey. And as mentioned in verse 10, and, the, and following that we persevere. I think that's my uh, key point this morning, to persevere. Uh, when you sin, persevere. When you're tired, persevere. Especially when your faith grows weak, persevere. Would you pray with me? Dear Father and Heaven, thank you uh, for this day. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for this time of worship and remembrance uh, to you. We remember Jesus, we remember his sacrifice on the cross for us. At this time, we, we take the bread and we remember the body that was shed on the cross for us and help us in our way to, to focus on, in on that and, uh, and just to live that today and through this week and persevere in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you again, grateful for, for that sacrifice so long ago for our sins, that covenant that helps to wash our sins away um, when we sin, when we have doubts, we, all we have to do is come to you, Lord, and, and per persevere. We pray that you be with each and every person here this week as we persevere at this time as we take the fruit of the vine help us to focus on the blood that was shed on the cross in jesus name
Good morning. I'm grateful to be here with you this morning, as always, when I get the opportunity to speak in front of you. Um, and today we're just going to jump right in, because the topic that I'm going to cover um, deserves our utmost attention. We are going to talk about a topic that has the ability to plague certain churches with division and decimation, while also being a driving reason for other churches that are experiencing growth and prosperity. The topic today is question. Questions are powerful, but a dangerous tool all at the same time. Used across the world by many people, uh, and people of all ages are asking questions daily for a bunch of different reasons. Um, my son is very inquisitive right now. He's very much in this question stage. So what, a couple weeks ago, about two weeks ago, we ate a meal called Burger Bowls. It's very complicated. You put every ingredient of a burger into a bowl and you eat it. Um, not much to it. But what happens is that that's just not good enough for him. He wants to know the why behind everything and the who behind everything. So I got questions like this. Who makes the tomatoes? And well, they come from the ground, they, uh, and they start to explain the situation. Huh, what about cheese? And so I start to explain cheese. Well, but who makes the cheese? The people that work at the cheese factory. I don't, I don't know. And so then we go through, then I have to talk about what ground beef is actually made of. And so we talk about cows, and that was an interesting conversation in itself. So, but I'm going through, and until his five-year-old mind is satisfied with all the answers, he keeps on asking questions. There's just more and more questions. So I'm asking you today, do we ask questions like a five-year-old? Do we use questions to help our faith grow? Are we asking questions to search for truth and answers and to understand that we could be doing things wrong in the same breath. It's not something that we have to hide from, but do we? Do we hide from it? That's today's topic, and it's hard. It's not easy. And I understand that there, I'm gonna say some things today that are probably gonna rub people the wrong way. And my intention is not to hurt feelings, but it's to grow understanding. It's to make sure that we know that we are not so focused about some things that we don't allow questions to arise from others and from ourselves 
that would stop us from being a better Christian and a better servant to our God. So, if we're going to have a sermon on questions, the first question that you have to answer is, why? Why? That is the most common question that is asked by people. And so, to answer the question why, we're going to look at it at two different ways. We're going to start with understanding why people don't ask questions. What keeps people from asking questions? And to do that, I enlisted the help of the brilliant internet, right? I use Google, and I search top ten reasons why people don't ask questions. Very simple. And as I read through all the different articles, and I, I explored a couple different avenues, I learned a couple different things. These are a few things that showed up on most of the lists I read through. People don't ask questions for fear, because they're too prideful. They have jealousy of other people knowing the answers that they don't have the answers to. They are accepting of their own ignorance, and they just don't care. They just don't care to know the answer. And as I read through those articles and I kind of combined this list together, I said, you know what? That sounds like my life in certain areas at different times. There's times when I've been fearful of what the answer might be, when my pride has said I should know this and I'm too prideful to ask a question, when I might experience some jealousy because, you know, Sally Jane, who's down the road from me, might be a little bit smarter. I might be a little jealous of that. I'm accepting of my own ignorance. That speaks for itself. And then there's other times when I just don't, just don't care. It's just not something that interests me. So I said, you know, that makes sense. I can relate to all those. But then I stumbled across an article called Three Unexpected Reasons Why People Don't Ask Questions. And this is the part that I think is very relatable to the church. The reasons in the article are as follows. People don't ask questions because the answerer has to have an answer. The person you're asking the question to has to have an answer. The second reason would be People don't ask questions because the person that they're asking the question to, the answerer, feels like they have to save the person who's asking the question. And the last reason is this. People don't ask questions because the answerer feels like they have to maintain control of the conversation. As I said before, this is going to be hard to hear because I'm speaking about Christians. That's what I'm doing. And the three individual points focus around this idea of control. As Christians, we have a hard issue with our own selves of letting go of control. And that's hard. That's hard. But as Christians, we both share, we share experiences and the issues with both parties. We've been the questioner and the answerer all in one foul swoop. There are situations where you're going to not ask the question, and there are situations where you're trying to give so much answer that you haven't even, you forgot why you tried to answer the question in the first place. And that's the problem. Young Christians today are too fearful to ask questions because they're not looking for saving. They're not looking for you to save them. They are looking for growth. Young Christians don't need you or I to save them. Jesus already saved them. That's already established. When you accept Christ onto baptism, you have the basic understanding that he has saved you. And young Christians don't need us to try and fill that spot because it's already there. What they need from us is honesty of the road that each of us has traveled. They want us to be willing to walk beside them not in front of them. They don't want this feeling of you always have to leave them, but they want you to hold their hand as you take them alongside you for this long journey. Because just like you can pick them up, there are also times when they can pick you up too. They are not looking for saving. Christ demands that we walk this world as if we are not worldly, but understanding that we are called to the higher standard. That's what Jesus calls us to. Imagine this. Let's change our, the, our perception or the perception about Christians. 
Let's change it from this. Christians are always just going to judge to this. Christians are always going to love you. They're always going to love you. And if we did that, don't you think we'd be getting a lot more questions about how to accept God's undying love? All right, that's the first spiel. Here's the second one. Time to answer part two of the why. The part two of the why we need to be asking questions is because there are people who came before us that asked questions in the Bible, and they got answers. They received answers. Not all of them that they liked, but they received answers. And I'll tell you why that's important here in a little bit. Did you know biblical scholars say that there are roughly 3,300 questions asked in the Bible? The average Bible, excluding these monsters, these things are like 2,700 pages, the average Bible is roughly a thousand pages. That means 3.3 questions per page. That's what that comes out to, that's math, okay? Men and women of the Bible in the past are asking questions, and what do we know about them? It, re it revolves back to my main point of they were receiving answers. So we're gonna look at that right now. So let's start with Abraham. So if you have a Bible, go ahead, or a phone, turn to Genesis 15. That's where we're gonna to start today. Um, we know that Abraham is really introduced in Genesis 11, is when we first get to talk about Abram, but right now it's, we're gonna take a look at 15 because this is really when Abraham first starts to question what God's plan is for him. So chapter 15, verse two and three is where we're gonna be at right here. It says, but Abram said, O Lord, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. So skip down, down to verse 7. And it says, and God says to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur and the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But Abraham questions again, O oh Lord God, how am, I to, how am I to know that I shall possess it? We know, um, you know, uh, Ken was just up here talking about Abraham in chapter 17 of Genesis, which we'll get to here shortly. We, we know that Abraham is going to be, his offsprings are going to be kings. We know that he will have descendants as vast as the star in the sky. But even that man of faith that God gave so much asked questions. There was time when he didn't know what to expect. And that's fair. We're so fearful about the idea of just saying, I don't know, that we'd rather just sit down and just keep it internal. And have the potential of not letting God work through us in order to just save ourselves. Save ourselves from embarrassment. Save ourselves and keep our pride. Save ourselves from just being open, being honest. And that's a problem. That's a problem. Like I said, we'll get to chapter 17, and that's where we're going to turn to right now. Chapter 16 is when um, we, when uh, Hagar is going to bear um, Ishmael. And then chapter 17 is when God and Abraham talk again. So turn to Genesis 17, and we are going to be in verse. Verse 3. It says, Then Abram fell on his face, and, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and ye shall be the father of a multitude of nations, no longer shall you be called Abram, but you shall name your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offsprings, and you throughout the generations for an everlasting covenant to be God's be to you and your offsprings after you. And I will give to you and your offsprings after the lands of your sojourning, 
all the lands of Canaan and everlasting possessions, and I will be their God. Um, and God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offsprings after you and throughout your generation. And then I want to skip down over here, down to verse 17. So, so the, the notice right here is that God went out and talked to Abraham and is saying here everything that's going to happen. He's explaining it. He's laying it out right in front of him. And here's what Abraham says in verse 17. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to him, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? A question. Abraham can't even believe it. He's saying, God, I'm a hundred years old. And you're telling me that my descendant is not supposed to be Ishmael, but you're going to give my wife, who's been barren for 90 years, a child? He even approaches God with a question. But what does God do? We know that Isaac is born. And we know that God fulfills his promise. So it revolves back around to that point of control. Abraham needed to control the situation. I can't believe it, God, even though you have something in the works, that you can do something so miraculous. God laid it out to him, but he still was fearful about that. Abraham couldn't believe. Next, I want to talk about the book of Habakkuk. So if you go over and flip there, we'll be in chapter 1. Chapter 1. Habakkuk is interesting because it starts off right away with questions to God. He doesn't understand why God would bring destruction to Assyria using the Babylonians. That's the question here. There, there's no understanding. So in chapter 1, verse 2, it says this. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for your help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. And then if you skip down, down to verse 5, this is where it gets really interesting. Because I think this is the part where Christians have the most trouble understanding. Verse 5, it says the Lord's answer. And it says, look among the nations and see wonder and be astounded. For I am doing work in your days that you would not believe if told. God is saying to him, look all around you. Look all around you and see what I've created. And guess what? More so than that, there's a bigger plan that even if I broke it down for you and explained it to you, you still wouldn't get it. You still wouldn't get it. But they dialogue back and forth through the end of chapter 2. But listen to how differently it sounds at chapter 3, verse 17. So if you turn to chapter 3, starting at verse 17, listen to the difference. We started at a very questionable state. And this is where we end the book. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on vines, the, produ the produce of the oil fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like deers. He makes me tread on my high places. What a difference. What comes from asking questions? We see a complete 180, a complete change of heart from the man who asked the question at the beginning to the understanding of what was coming at the end. What came from the question? Though Habakkuk couldn't understand why this was happening in the first place, at the end, it stated that he will put his faith in God. Now lastly, I want to kind of go, to, or I want to turn to Matthew 16, um, starting in 13. Matthew 16, starting in verse 13, we'll read through verse 20. Even Jesus asked questions. Even Jesus was there 
throughout the Bible asking questions of people. So starting in verse 13, it says this. Now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one, that he was the Christ. In a sermon about questions, this is definitely the climax. For, for, first off, the one asking questions is Jesus. So you can imagine when he's asking questions in front of the disciples, and when Peter responds, that there's probably some nerves. I, I know that if Jesus asked me a question up to my face, I would probably be nervous. Be like, man, I know there's a lot of opportunity to not answer correctly. And I would feel the nerves that come with that. Second off, this is the first time in the book of Matthew that Jesus has confirmed the notion that he is the Son of God, Son of the living God. But I want to reread verse 17. It says this, And Jesus said to him, or Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Peter's knowledge has nothing to do with him, um, with him knowing that Jesus is the Son of God. But the Spirit working in him is what gave Peter that knowledge. Jesus confirms that. He said, it's not by flesh and blood that you know, but my Father, who is in heaven, revealed this to you. Jesus said that. At the end of the day, we can recognize that those who are asking questions are doing so to ensure that the path of action that they take is ensuring the completion of God's truth for his will. That's why people are asking questions. They are asking questions, understanding, and being able to admit that they are at fault for not knowing, but they want to grow and the ability and the knowledge of God's will and best set themselves up to teach other about that same knowledge and will. I can't give somebody God's undying love if I don't know how I received it in the first place. When I accept it on his baptism and I grow in him and I study about him and I start to understand what his love means to me, I should want to share that recognizing that it's not my gift, but God's gift that he gave to me that I can then share to others. That's the purpose. But I don't get there from without asking questions. To learn how to, or to understand about what baptism is, I had to ask questions to figure that out. I asked these questions. Abraham asked questions. God, you tell me that I'm going to have all these descendants? How? Explain it to me. And God gave him that answer. He said, you will have descendants. And it starts with Isaac. This is where your descendants start. Habakkuk didn't understand. God, why are you using Babylon to destroy Assyria? And God said, listen, you, don't, you can't understand it, even if I broke it down into you. But in chapter 2, that's where we get the righteous that live by faith. That's where we get that first starting verse of that. And he says, you need to have faith in my plan. And at the end of the day, that's when Habakkuk comes back around and says, at the end of the day, I believe in God. And I understand that God is my strength. And he's my love. And he's what brings me through each day. And then Jesus asked the question to the disciple, who do you think I am? And Peter came up to him and said, you are the Lord. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And based off of that, Jesus rewards him saying, Peter, 
based pretty much based off of your confession, your understanding of who I am due to the Father revealing that to you, I am going to build my church upon you. You are going to be that cornerstone of the church to come. Questions are scary. Questions make us feel uncomfortable. Questions make us doubt. But Christians are not called to fear questions. Christians are not called to fear questions. We as Christians have committed our lives to God in hope that we can continue to show our light and share undying love and never-ending grace to those who are in the dark. That's it. That's what we're called to do. That's the Great Commission. Go out. Baptize people in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them. Sharing with them. Don't hoard this great thing that we have, but take it out and share it with them. But you can't share something if when someone asks you a question, you turn them away. What's that say about us? If someone asks us a hard question, and instead of just admitting that we don't have a great answer, we say, well, you shouldn't ask that question. Or we say, we don't even tell them that we want to research together or learn together. We just say, I'll pray for you about that. that that's not the way to reach people and show them love. The way to do that is by being honest. It comes back to that honesty factor of saying, I don't have a great answer. But man, I would love to study with you and find the answer together. Who says that we have to do it alone? Sometimes when people are asking us questions, we feel like if we can't come up with the answer on our own accord, then it's not worth sharing. That is the biggest baloney I've ever heard. It's just hogwash. It is. I can't imagine someone being so smart that they can come up with every perfect answer on their own. What we need to do is rely on them. It goes back to that idea of young Christians aren't asking us to save them. They want us to walk beside them. Don't fear the question. Instead, look at it as an opportunity. When we reject questions, you've now rejected the Holy Spirit's opportunity to work within you. You've now rejected the Holy Spirit's opportunity to work within somebody else. Why would we do that to God? Why would we not let his gift that he's given us be shared and been, been able to be used in an opportunity to grow his kingdom? That goes against everything we stand for as Christians. It doesn't make sense. So what we need to do instead of fearing the question is accepting the question and growing in love and compassion and grace for everybody. Knowing that somebody's going to ask me a question that I don't know the answer of, but I hope that they have the understanding and the love to be, bear with me as we find out truths together, while also I'm going to ask questions of other people that they might not have the answer to. But that's okay. Because lucky for us, God doesn't tell us that the perfect Christian is molded in a day. He doesn't sit there and say to you, well, if you didn't figure it out the first time, there's, there's nothing for you as a Christian. He extends undying grace. He extends never-ending love. And he gives us all the tools and compassion to continue to fight and grow together. 1 Timothy 1.7. If you'll turn there, we'll end here. 1 Timothy 1.7. I can't read because I turned to First Thessalonians one time, but that's okay. First Timothy one seven, it says this: desiring to be teachers, that's definitely not the right verse. Hmm. That's definitely not the right verse, even though that's definitely what I wrote. Give me a second. I am very sorry. All right, let's do Second Timothy one seven. We'll get there. We're coming in right now. Second Timothy 1 7 is definitely the right verse. It says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self control. 
when you work in a life of fear, you are not working within the spirit that God gave you. Per the Bible. That's what the Bible says. When you are working in a spirit of fear, you are not working with the love and power that God gave you. Not having an answer is okay. It, it, it is. Anybody who tells you differently is wrong. Not having an answer right away is okay. Not getting the response you were hoping to when trying to help somebody when you answer their question is okay too. Sometimes we get so caught up in the response we think, man, I just answered that question so perfectly that they're just gonna just fall right in and say, that made so much sense. And then two seconds later they say, I still have no idea what you're talking about. And that's okay. At the end of the day, we're stewards of what God calls us to do. We are called to be, we are called to sharpen our mind and soften our hearts. Always willing to accept others while also being the first to admit our blemishes. So the question I want to ask you today as we close up is this. Have we been living our Christianity out in fear? Fear to change, fear to accept things that make us uncomfortable, fear of not being accepted by our peers. And if so, are we ready to fully commit to the spirit which God gave us to work out of power and love in order to help other people become Christian? That's my thought for you today. It's okay. Being broken is okay. We don't have to put up a face. We're actually called to be open, be softened, be understanding. But let's do it together so we can be fortified as a unit in order to grow each other personally and grow the church of God as a whole. Let's grow together. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Watch the waters part before us now. Watch the waters part.